The following is intended only for mature audiences. Viewer discretion advised. Hey hey people, Raz here. Welcome to the Intrawar period. The Intrawar literally just being the gap between World War I and World War II. This period would be the formative years for many of the armies that would go into battle during World War II. It was an especially important period for tank design and tank doctrine. Since Germany could not build tanks anymore, they exported their best engineers to nations like Czechoslovakia, Sweden, and Russia. This allowed them to create some heavily armored quote-unquote tractors so they could still abide by the Treaty of Versailles and train up their tank forces until 1939. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today's episode is about the Spanish Civil War. This was arguably the most important event to happen during this period since it was the first war to happen on mainland Europe since World War I. It would become a testing ground for Russian, British, Italian, French, and German tanks and tactics. But we're not here to talk about them today, no. Today we're here to talk about Spain. So join me today in the Ballet de la Muerte known as the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War was a convoluted mess of ideologies, philosophies, and copious amounts of war crimes. In many ways, what happened in Spain was inevitable. For almost 500 years, Spain was a monarchy. After the continued failure of the king to hold together the empire, the powerful in the country decided to form a constitutional monarchy. For the last 50 years, Spain had been under a semi-military dictatorship where the king was just a figurehead. With most of the empire now gone, and the country suffering from the Great Depression and the aftermath of the Rift Wars in Morocco, the people had had enough. The build-up to the Spanish Civil War took place over five years, between 1931 and 1936, and in that time there was a lot of riots, death, and elections that half the country didn't like. For the purpose of this video, all you need to know is that two sides started to form over this period. You had the New Republic, which was an amalgamation of communists, socialists, anarchists, liberals, and Trotskys. They were all held together by the idea that the Republic would unite them in one cause to reform the country and bring it into the 21st century. They fought for the self-rule of Catalonia and the Basque Country, land reform, freedom of the individual, equal rights for women and non-landowners, nationalization of the bank, the freedom of speech and religion, and most importantly, freedom from oppression. The opposition parties to the Republic formed next. These were collectively known as the Nationalists. This party was mainly comprised of the wealthy elite, the military, and the devout Catholic farmers who lived and worked in the countryside of Spain. This group consisted of Flancus, Carlist, and the Catholic Coalition. These parties wanted the restoration of the monarchy, the church, and a strong fascist military to unify the country and keep the Republic from destroying their way of life. They saw Spain as a peaceful Catholic conglomeration of regions who were united in the common cause of Spanish nationality and sought to reform the country and restore Spain to its former glory. Over the period that led up to the Spanish Civil War, the Second Spanish Republic started making a lot of changes, which pissed off the nationalists. Basically, the country was still in many ways a feudal economy with landlords and the Catholic Church holding a majority of the power in the country. If you were just a regular worker or peasant, you lived a menial existence in which you were underpaid and working in truly horrible conditions. Essentially, the Republic wanted to make changes to the system by reforming laws, workers' rights, and land ownership. The landowners, military, and church hated this because they were afraid it would divide Spain and get rid of their power. So they stagnated these changes as long as they possibly could. Because of all this tension between the haves and have-nots, the military, who was very conservative, decided they were going to overthrow the New Republic and try to restore the Spain of old. They decided that they would get the military garrisons in seven of Spain's major cities to capture those cities, and then Francisco Franco, who was stationed in the Canary Islands, would sneak on a plane and fly to Morocco. Once there, he would lead the Moorish troops into Spain and overthrow the Republic. 
Hilariously, a very good documentary I found actually interviewed the pilot who flew him down there, and it's pretty funny. He asked me if I was prepared to go to the Canary Islands to get a riff leader to start a, an insurrection in Spanish Morocco. Uh, I thought, what a delightful idea. What a great adventure. That mad lad always cracks me up. Anyways, the military had started a coup. They managed to take over two of the seven major cities in Spain they had planned to take. To their surprise, the people of the Republic armed themselves and started fighting back against the military. What followed were several weeks of violent and brutal war crimes across the country. Churches were burned, people were executed in the streets, and many people were thrown into jail. When the smoke cleared, 60% of the Spanish military and 50% of the Spanish police force had defected to Franco's side. The Republic decided to disband the remaining army because several units that had gone up to the front lines defected to Franco's side. Naturally, it's hard to fight a war when that keeps happening, so the Republic opted to have all the different parties recruit local militias instead. At this point, the battle lines had been drawn. Southeast of Spain, Catalonia and the Basque Country were firmly in Republican hands, and the center of Spain became the bastion of right-wing nationalist resistance. Germany and Italy decided to back Franco's nationalist forces, and Russia decided to back the Republic. All that was left was for Franco to move his army from Morocco to Spain. General Capo was able to capture Seville, establishing a bridgehead for them to cross. Now it was time for Germany to shine. The German Condor Legion landed Junkers Ju-52s in Morocco and began ferrying Franco's forces across the strait into Spain. In total, they transferred 13,523 Spanish troops across the strait. As Franco's forces landed, more and more towns started to revolt and turn nationalist. In response, the Republican towns rounded up anyone who was a right-winger and threw them in jail because they were afraid they would revolt. For the next few months, unchecked violence would rip through the countryside. Once the Republican militias had cleared the major cities of the revolutionaries, they went to the countryside to bring the fight to the Nationalists. The whole war seemed pretty surreal at this point. Many of the Republic militia fighters would wake up in their houses, have their wives cook them a breakfast, and then go to the front. They would pack a lunch with a few bottles of wine and set out as if it were a picnic. Once the fighting had died down for the day, they would go home and have dinner with their families, and they would wake up the next day and do it all over again. In response, homegrown nationalist militias formed outside the cities and in the countryside waiting for reinforcement from Franco's army. General Mola eventually consolidated his forces and recruited German units to train his men. Germany sent tanks, cannons, and the infamous Condor Legion. On their way into Spain, all German forces were officially labeled as tourists, and their commander was labeled as their tour guide. Once in Spain, the units were called drones, and they were commanded by beekeepers, and they were outfitted with agricultural equipment. Of course, these agricultural tractors were actually Panzer Ones. Approximately 16,000 German soldiers and airmen would participate in the Spanish Civil War. Also around this time, Italy sent planes, CV-33 tanks, and artillery pieces. In total, Italy provided 75,000 troops, and Germany provided 16,000. The German Condor Legion started coordinating with Franco's forces and performing massive bombing campaigns. On the Republican side, some 40,000 men formed up in volunteer militias from other nations. They came from Ireland, Greece, the Philippines, the US, Brazil, Norway, Belgium, Britain, Australia, Romania, Greece, Germany, Russia, and more places than people cared to document. Officially, Britain, France, and the U.S. were neutral during the conflict. However, many nations would buy oil and commodities from both sides throughout the war, providing more money to fuel the fire. The Russians backed the mostly communist Republican forces with tanks, airplanes, and artillery. Unlike the Nationalists, Russia forced the Spanish Republic to pay for their war material. The Republican forces had a much harder time becoming a regular fighting force because each faction recruited its own fighting militias and discipline was hard to maintain because they would take a popular vote each time an order was given to see if they would carry it out or not. In stark contrast to this, other regions like Barcelona were largely under anarchist control. 
The anarchists refuse to take power or form a localized government or any centralized command structure. They instead formed anti-fascist militias that would go out into popular battle voted on by the collective. All food was shared and all work was done for the good of the community. Factories were taken over by unions and working conditions were improved for the first time in Spain's history. There was no centralized command structure, rather every person was treated equally and received the same food rations. Money was abolished and all work was done for the greater good of the collective. What kind of garbage is that? Oops, my anarchy symbol. In contrast to this, the Basque Country was largely Catholic, French influenced, and was fighting a war of independence since they saw themselves as a region all of their own. They were farmers, miners, and steelworkers who wanted self-rule and more freedom from the Spanish government. In Madrid, the Communist Party was largely in control, both bolstered by the centralization of the party and the support from Russia. That's when the purges began. As Franco's forces pushed closer, they started murdering bosses, debt collectors, and landowners. No trial was given and no evidence was collected. All you need to do is point your finger and claim that they were nationalists and they would be rounded up and shot. As soon as Franco's forces landed in Spain, they started to make a coordinated push north to connect their armies, effectively splitting the country in half. They pushed into Toledo, Cordoba, and Zaragoza. As their forces closed in, they besieged the capital of Madrid. Learning of the horrors the Republican militias had brought to the Nationalist supporters, Franco's forces began a campaign of revenge. If you had any affiliation to the Republic, you were executed on the spot. In Badajoz, they rounded up anyone who was Republican and executed them in the bullring. Between two and 4,000 people were executed within a week. In Madrid, the city jail caught fire. Rather than relocate the Nationalist prisoners, the guards began executing them in the courtyard. Bloody and senseless killing like this would continue throughout the rest of the Civil War. 1937 would become a turning point for Franco. Nationalist troops closing in had all but sealed the Basque Country's fate. They started a bombing campaign against the cities of the Basque Country. Guernica would be almost wiped off the map. The carnage there would be immortalized by Pablo Picasso. This would be the first city completely destroyed by a bombing raid and would become a grim preview of the many bombing raids to come during the Second World War. Again, the bombers were used at Bilbao. The defenders of that city had erected a wall of iron and stone, but that would not protect against the relentless bombing raids. Once the walls had been softened by the Condor Legion, Franco's forces flung themselves into the city and the Basque Country had fallen. Now that the Basque Country was out of the way, Franco could focus on Catalonia and Madrid. In response to the fall of the Basque Country, Russia sent more air support to help the Republic. While it wasn't effective at stopping the bombing raids, it did provide some comfort to the defenders of some of these cities to finally see friendly planes in the sky. The defenders of the city of Madrid adopted the phrase, No Pasaden, which means they shall not pass. Regular people grabbed shovels and picks and started constructing fortifications all around the city. At this point, Franco began staging attack after attack against Madrid. Some of the strongest fighting in the city took place around the University of Madrid. However, most of these battles were fought over the hills and fields surrounding the city where Franco's nationalist forces held the advantage. Franco had managed to capture 150 T-26 tanks and had close to 600 of his own provided by Germany and Italy. Germany found their tanks lacking. While the MV-13s were effective against soldiers, the enemy T-26s and later BT-5s had too thick of armor for them to be effective. Because of this, the Germans would arm some of their Panzer ones with the Breda autocannon and eventually some flamethrowers. As 1938 grew closer, the Communist Party of Madrid took over and began consolidating power. They started maintaining centralized control over the Spanish Republic and started making demands of the anarchists. They wanted the anarchist militias to fight for them, and they wanted to incorporate them into the Republican army. Since the anarchists were anti-establishment, they denied. They said they were fighting for themselves and only fighting popular combat and did not want to be made into traditional soldiers. The communists were also demanding control of the anarchist collectives in Catalonia and threatened to end the home rule of Catalonia and the Basque Country. This caused tension to boil over, and a civil war within a civil war broke out. Everything the Basque Country and Catalonia had fought for was now being stripped away by the Communists. When the Communists tried to take over an anarchist-held telephone building in Barcelona, this resulted in an armed revolt 
and the anarchist faction rose up across the city in what would be called the Barcelona May Days. Street to street fighting broke out for five days and nearly 500 people were killed. Many anarchist leaders wanted the rebellion to lay down their arms so the whole war would not be lost. The anarchist soldiers thought their leadership had betrayed them, and if they were to lay down their arms, it would mean an end to the revolution. Eventually, the communist forces were able to overpower them and disarm the remaining anarchists. After the May Day events, Largo Calvaro, the socialist leader of the Republic, was overthrown and replaced with the more authoritarian leader, Juan Negrin. Many in the Republic believed this was the turning point of the war. The communists now held a majority and were very authoritarian. This turned off the supporters in the Basque Country and Catalonia. Many on the Republican side no longer believed in the cause they were fighting for. In their eyes, this had now become a communist war. 1938 would see the division of the Republic's North and South forces. Franco's armies made a march for the sea and divided Catalonia from Madrid. In response, thousands of Catalonians would flee to France to seek shelter from the relentless bombing raids of the Condor Legion and Franco's artillery barrages. Seeing the writing on the wall, in July 1938 the Republicans launched one last offensive against Franco's forces. They saw that a European war was coming soon, and the Republic was desperately trying to hang on so they could join the Allies and get international support. The Republic forces crossed the Ebro River. This would be an all-out war of attrition. Thousands would die fighting in the countryside, fighting over ditches, roads, and hills. Franco would order the biggest artillery barrage of the whole war and follow it up with a massive tank charge. The Republican forces were decimated. The rocky terrain lacked any dirt to build trenches and the constant shelling left them with no cover from the artillery. Compounding the explosions were fragments of rock that had splintered and become shrapnel, literally shredding the Republican forces. After several weeks of fighting, the Republican army was a shell of its former self. They retreated, leaving behind large amounts of equipment, tanks, and weapons that would be captured and turned against them. After the Munich Agreement between Britain, France, and Germany, Russia decided to change its stance on providing aid to Spain. Now isolated and fearing Germany would invade Russia, Stalin cut all aid to Spain and the Republic was now on its own. Germany did the exact opposite and increased military aid to Spain to bring the war to an end soon. Germany had plans to invade Poland in 1939 and won this conflict to be over so they could concentrate their forces and munitions for that assault. With non-intervention pacts signed by Italy, Germany, and many of the nations on the Allied side, the international brigades departed Spain. 10,000 Italians and nearly 8,000 internationals departed. As 1938 ended, Barcelona was being bombed into submission. Then it happened, in early 1939, the Nationalists marched into Catalonia, and many Catholics and Republicans rejoiced. For the first time in years, they could demonstrate their Catholicism openly. Mass began on the streets each morning, and celebrations did not end for three days. Franco's forces started collecting the remaining anarchists and holding massive tribunals sentencing hundreds to death at the same time. So many bullets were used that they had to take a two-day break from the killing because they ran out of ammunition. Most, who weren't killed right away, were rushed into jails or concentration camps. There, they would wait for over 30 years. Nearly 500,000 people would be locked away across 137 concentration camps in Spain. A survivor of these camps compared it to the Holocaust. He said the only difference is that there was no organization. He said the killing was often sporadic and random. Usually, someone would come from one of the villages where the war had taken place and pick out some random prisoners who were from their village. Then they would drive about a mile down the road and start executing them where everyone in the camp could hear. He said often you were sentenced to death and would wait for years to be executed. Sometimes they just lost your execution paperwork and you would survive due to a clerical error. As soon as Catalonia fell, the writing was on the wall for the Republic. Madrid tried to negotiate for peace, but Franco wanted an unconditional surrender. The Republican government was in disarray. Casado launched a coup to overthrow Negrin. Negrin's government now packed up their bags and fled Spain. Casado was now the de facto leader of the Republic. He tried to reach out to Franco to negotiate for an honorable peace. For two weeks he tried, and for two weeks Franco held out. Casado had no choice. He raised the white flag. On March 28, 1939, Franco's forces walked into Madrid unopposed. 
On April 1st, his army reached the coast and occupied the rest of the Republic. The war was now over. The Spanish Civil War would be remembered as a very complicated conflict that still haunts Spain to this very day. Franco would attempt to restore the Spain of old, and in doing so would create a dictatorship with himself at the center. At the end of this war, 250,000 would die as a result of direct combat, and 300,000 would die as a result of the executions, bombings, or random violence. Unfortunately, we still don't know how many were killed in the concentration camps over the 30 plus years Franco was in control. In 1975, Franco died, leaving Spain to pick up the pieces. He left a divided nation still struggling to heal from the wounds of the war and years of oppression. In many ways, the tension of the Spanish Civil War never really dissipated, and even today you can still see it in Spanish politics. Oof, I don't know about you guys, but I think after that story I could use a drink. Anyways, it's time for the review, but first, let's see what gifts God King Kobe has provided for us today. Ah, it's a fine bottle of white wine made with Idrin grapes. Fun fact, wine and rum were the two most consumed alcohols during the Spanish Civil War. White wine was grown in the Catalan region of Spain, and because of this it was a largely Republican wine. In fact, when Franco eventually took over Spain, he got rid of the production of white wine for the most part, and only exported it. He saw white wine as a frivolous luxury since only red wine was needed for communion. Because of this, white wine in many ways became a symbol of the resistance. Throughout the years of Franco's rule, the people of Spain would keep growing it for their own personal supplies and continue to produce it in secret until his eventual death in 1975. Under Franco, the Catalan wine industry was almost ruined. It came back in a big way once Juan Carlos came to power. Thankfully, you can still enjoy a bottle of white Catalan wine. <laughs> Anyways, on to the review. Back when Germany was still subscribed to the cult of the machine gun, they built this beauty. While several people in the German High Command saw the Panzer I as a training vehicle, that didn't stop them from using it all around the world. It saw use in Spain, Poland, France, Africa, and even limited use in Russia. Weirdly enough, the color scheme Kobe went with for this tank is actually the color a lot of these tanks were painted during the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish troops had to repaint these once they landed because the dark gray color scheme would stand out too much on the battlefield. Many were repainted camo, tan, or a lighter shade of gray like the one you see here. Kobe will have a new model out later this year with a darker color scheme, so I'll probably be doing another Panzer I review eventually. The Panzer I had a lot of problems. It was known for having issues where the lower idler wheel in the back caused the track to slip off during combat. Also, they found a lot of issues with the armor, especially the V-slits where the armor wasn't actually bulletproof. The reason I chose the Spanish Civil War for this video is because it was the only time this tank was actually used effectively. Spain was very mountainous and hilly, so the CV-33 and Panzer I were good fits for the combat that took place there. Unfortunately, when Russia introduced the T-26, they were outclassed in almost every way. Even here, you can see the size difference and the difference in all the guns these vehicles used. That being said, I have very few problems with this model of the Panzer I. It's sturdy, so both kids and adults can enjoy this model. It looks great, it functions great. It has great detailing on the track, suspension, and rear. It does have some issues with rolling, but so did the real tank, so A plus for authenticity, I guess. The only two things I don't like about this model are the fact that it's too big, and also the machine guns don't move up or down. To compare, I also happen to have the old version of this Kobe tank too. You can see the difference in the size and detailing between the old and new models. They were also different variants. The Model A had four road wheels and two exhaust pipes. The Model B had five road wheels and one single exhaust pipe on the back. Anyways, if I had to rate this tank, I would give it a 7 out of 10. Sadly, the size, color, and turret issues hold it back at the end of the day. Before I go, I did want to highlight one of the coolest aspects of this war, which is that women were used as frontline combat troops. Many enjoyed new freedoms most other women wouldn't see until the 1960s. Because of that, I wanted to show you some of the cool things they were up to during this war. Enjoy!
as usual, you're all truly wonderful. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.